good morning. Let's all take off our tiaras and our crowns this morning and cede the seat of honor to Jesus as it is Christ the King Sunday. And so that Christ might reign in this place within us, let's take a moment to center ourselves. I invite you to take a deep breath. And I invite you to make your breath a prayer. That as you inhale, you're inviting the spirit into your space. And as you exhale, you're able to let everything else go. All of your worries, all of your doubts, all of your busyness, what you could be doing if you weren't here. So that we might be truly present to God's spirit and to one another. In that spirit of, of prayer, let us prepare our hearts for worship as we listen to our prelude. We are going to begin our worship this morning by singing. You are invited to stand in body or in spirit as we sing Majesty, Worship His Majesty.
You may be seated. And let's join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, we pray that your spirit truly would reign in our midst. Help us to forget ourselves. Help us to hear your voice above all other voices. And we know that it is in your power to speak to us in the silences as well as in the words prepared. Lord, may you find us receptive to your word and then to the work. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please join me in our prayer for illumination. Holy Spirit, we pray that you enter into the hearts, minds, and souls of those who hear these words of scripture. Illuminate the eternal essence of your being through our hearing of it and through your power. Transform this ink into the stuff of new life. Amen. Our first responsive reading is going to be from 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 4 through 9. Um, I'll read the non-bold, if you could join me in the bold part. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, You are old, and your sons do not follow in your ways. Appoint for us then a king to govern us like other nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to govern us. Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people and all they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them, just as they have done to me from the day I brought them up out of Egypt to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods. So also they are doing to you. Now then, listen to their voice only. You shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. Christ sympathizes with our weaknesses. The one we call king in every respect has been tested as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sin together in unison with a prayer that is prepared and then silently um, giving over to God whatever we know that we need to. So let us pray. Lord, however much we call you king, we fail to follow your call to us. We succumb to the political temptations of this temporary world, seeking power and security while you call us to service and hospitality, consuming your creation while you call us to care for it, hating our neighbors who you call us to love. In our failure to claim you, we identify more with the nations on our passports than with your kingdom. We pray that you reclaim us as your people, forgive us as your children, and continue to be our Lord and our hope for salvation. Amen. Hear the good news. Jesus Christ loves us, forgives us, and sets us free to sin no more. Thanks be to God. Let us stand and sing with joy. It's at this time that we get the joy of sharing with one another the peace of Christ. You are invited to turn to your neighbor and wish them the peace of Christ.
It is thoroughly enjoyable to watch everyone enjoying one another and the peace of Christ. We are going to continue with our next scripture lesson. Our second responsive reading comes from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observe... When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went, to the, went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. I'd like to invite the children forward. For the children's time, we're going to meet on the floor right in front. Good morning. Oh, I like your bunny. And I like that she has a scarf on. Hello, everybody. How's everybody this morning? Good. And you have a friend, too. A little Dalmatian puppy, I think. All right, so we just listened to a story about uh, the wise ones going to look for baby Jesus. Um, have, have you read the Christmas play yet? Yeah. Right? It's all about the wise ones coming home after they've been on this long journey, right? So they go and they're like, they're looking for this king that's going to be going to be born. And I, you know, I meant to bring a magazine uh, that comes to my house. Um, and it's, it's called Ola, which, are, uh, which is a, a magazine from Spain. And it has lots of it follows the lives of kings and queens around the world. What do you? Th what kind of lives, lifestyles? What kind do you think uh, that kings and queens have today? Do they live down the street from you? No, we don't have kings and queens here in the United States, right? So, but in other places, they they still have kings and queens. What kind do you think they live in? What kind of houses do you think they live in? Are they big? Or are they small? Castles, right? Yeah, it could be castles, but you know, do you think um, do you think they what kind of clothes do you think they wear? Yeah. Gold well, yeah, they could wear like lots of gold jewelry. i I was just thinking what kind of clothes. I think there's the clothes that they wear when they're in front of the camera and there's probably the sweatpants that they wear when they're at home. So you never know, right? But going to look for a king, you would you would think that or that they're going to it's gonna be really fancy and there's gonna be lots of people attending um, to you know to, to the king and the needs and it's gonna but in when they go and find Jesus, they find this little baby who's born where? In, in a little Bethlehem. In Bethlehem. In a little cottage. In a little cottage. In, Owen? Was he, what was he surrounded by? And I'm going to give you a hint. Moo. Buh. <laughs> and 
animals. He was surrounded by animals. He was, his crib was like a manger, which is where they put food for the animals. Like it was like filled with straw, right? So it was really, really, it was, it was humble. It was poor. He was born into just uh, dirt. <laughs> yeah. He was born into like the most... There was, <laughs> there was mud around. Uh, there was dust. There were spiders. Yeah, all of it. You know, it's all... And there was probably spider webs in the corner. Yes. Right? But one of the things that makes Jesus' birth so marvelous is that he doesn't come in with all of this grandeur and all of this money and all of this uh, opulence is the word that I want to use, but all of this, you know, frou-frou, whatever. It's just really simple. And he experiences um, what, a, you know, what, a lot of people. He came to be with the the poor. He came to be with the people who had needs. He came to be with um, people who you know didn't think too highly of themselves. He came to be with people like you and me, and which makes Jesus a different kind of king, and something that we can celebrate. So, can you show me how you fold your hands and close your eyes? Good job, and bow your heads. Dear God, thank you for being a different kind of king. Thank you for coming to be with us um, wherever we find ourselves. Thank you for being with your people in everything and through everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for being here this morning. You all are going to go head out that door with your Sunday school teachers, and we will see you later. Everyone else, we are as we're, they're going out, we're going to stand and sing Alleluia, sing to Jesus, which is number 144 in the hymnal.
Our third responsive reading comes from John 18, verses 33 through 37. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom belonged to this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Dave, you're doing that out of habit. We're not there. Every, yeah. <laughs> God bless you, and thank you. For, uh, praise God for the bass section this morning. Goes down. Reading from Revelation chapter 1, verses 4b through 8. Again, this is responsive. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests serving his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God, and let us join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts might be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock 
and our Redeemer. Amen. So when you research the origins of Christ the King Sunday, you end up taking a short course in history and poli sci. Pope Pius XI in the year 1925 uh, produced an encyclical called the Quas Primas in the face of rising fascism, think Mussolini, think Hitler, and ultranationalism and secularism. And out of this encyclical was created this feast of Christ the King. So let's define fascism. Fascism is a far right authoritarian and ultranationalist po political, ide <laughs> political ideology and movement characterized by a dictatorial leader, centralized autocracy, militarism, forcible suppression of opposition, belief in a natural social hierarchy, national so, mm -hmm. subordination of individual interests for the perceived good of the nation or race, and strong regimentation of society and the economy. Fascism is opposed to anarchism, democracy, pluralism, egalitarianism, liberalism, socialism, and Marxism. Fascism is at the far right of the traditional left-right spectrum. The traditional left-right spectrum comes to us from the French in the, uh, during the time of the French Revolution and was determined by who sat to the left or the right in the aisle. Generally, the left wing is characterized by an emphasis on ideas such as freedom, equality, fraternity, rights, progress, reform, and internationalism, while the right wing is characterized by an emphasis on notions such as authority, hierarchy, order, duty, tradition, reaction, and nationalism. I would love it if they did some kind of study based on, on personality like Myers-Briggs and Enneagram, whether different personalities lean one way or the other, and I would love to know whether birth order has anything to do with which way you lean. All the oldest children who enforce the rules and the youngest children who are like, stop telling me what to do. Anyway. In this day and age, you have to uh, ask people to define their terms because somebody can be on the left on, on one issue and on the right on the other. Uh, but of course, that would mean that we'd have to be curious and listen to one another to find that out. So back to the Pope. Jesus is king. He wrote in the encyclical, and if to Christ our Lord is given all power in heaven and on earth, it must be clear that not one of our faculties is exempt from his empire. He must reign in our minds. He must reign in our wills. He must reign in our hearts. He must reign in our bodies and in all our members. And just so you know, I boiled that way down from what he wrote. The reign of Christ Sunday was adopted in our tradition in the 1960s. So it started in the Catholic Church in, in the 20s, um, was adopted to be part of the liturgical year and our um, lectionary. This Sunday is the last Sunday of, of the lectionary year or the liturgical year. Advent starts the next year. And it is a way to look back um, at all that Christ has done, his death, his resurrection, the, the uh, Pentecost, the advent of the Holy Spirit. And now we're looking to the advent and the promise of Jesus coming again as a, uh, to reign as, um, to reign, period. So from the Presbyterian Church, we learn, as sovereign ruler, Christ calls us to a loyalty that transcends every earthly claim to the human heart. To Christ alone belongs the supreme allegiance in our lives. Christ calls us to stand with those who in every age confess, Jesus Christ is Lord. In every generation, demagogues emerge to claim an allegiance that belongs only to God. Demag demagogues, I was really hoping, um, I, there, there were some teenagers here because, um, as anyway, so d uh, d defining terms. Political leaders, demagogues are, and, and demagoguery is like one of those fun words to say, but demagogues, political le leaders who appeal to um, ordinary people's desires and prejudices rather than um, to rational argument. So in every generation, demagogues emerge to claim an allegiance that belongs only to God, but Christ alone has the right to claim our highest loyalty the blood of martyrs past and present witness to this truth. 
one of the great witnesses to the to Jesus and um, and to the kingdom of God, and I quoted him last week in worship is Tony Campolo, um, who passed away this week. Uh, Tony Campolo was a, an evangelist I, uh, who's part of my upbringing, um, just a wonderful uh, teacher and a social activist and just a wonderful human being. So, and he comes up in, as I'm researching for this week, he's known for saying, it is not enough to simply claim that Jesus is your savior. Is Jesus your Lord? What does it mean that Jesus is both Lord and savior? It means that we follow Jesus in his way. We have journeyed through the Bible this morning in our scripture lesson, starting with in 1 Samuel, where the people say, we want a king. Samuel, your sons, you know, they don't measure up. We don't want them. Uh, and so rather than allow for God to choose the next judge, they say, no, we want a king. They wanted a king to rule in times of peace and lead in times of war. And Samuel says over and over again, he will take, he will take, he will take from you. They still say they want a king. You will be conscripted. You will become forced labor. You, your land will be confiscated. The king will levy taxes and use your property. And they still insisted, we want a king. And ironically, even if God helps them find a king, that king is gonna say, well, my, my sons are gonna reign after me and their sons and their sons and their sons, right? And we've seen repeatedly in scripture, Eli's son, sons, mm-mm. -mm. Samuel's sons, mm-mm. -mm. David's sons, you know, because um, first there's Saul and then there's David, and then we're gonna see that fiasco, right? So this is why God says to Samuel, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me because I would have raised up a leader for them who is honorable and worthy. So fast forward to the New Testament and God provides a king who would be born in a manger, whose birth would put earthly rulers on edge. And at the end of his life, Paul uh, Pilate questions Jesus, are you the king of Jews? This is, this is said as sarcasm. He, he's shown up, he's already been beaten. There's no army. There's no, you know, there's no great, you know, revolution going on. Are you the king of the Jews? Pilate allows for more beatings. They put a crown of thorns on his head and a purple robe, and they beat him and taunt him by saying, hail, king of the Jews. And then when he dies, he's put on a cross, and over his head, the king of the Jews meant to mock him. But ironically, or without intending, the true nature of leadership is exalted because that's what leadership looks like being willing to sacrifice oneself for one's people. Leadership is service to the lowly and the least. The king would be on his knees wiping our feet. The king puts himself last and not first. The king is willing to die for his people. So if Christ is king, then he reigns in our lives. And we seek to emulate him, our allegiance is to him. I found this prayer online, somebody else who was tasked in, in her church to research Christ the King, and she got her colleagues together and they, and they crafted this prayer. Most gracious God, who in Jesus of Nazareth showed us an alternate, alternative to the kings, queens, and emperors of history, help us to revere and emulate Jesus' leadership, to love and to seek justice for all people. Help us to recognize the true grandeur and life-changing power based in loving you and all our neighbors. In Christ Jesus, with you and the Holy Spirit, may we co-create a world ruled not through domination, but in that radical and all-powerful compassion and love. Amen. This is all lovely. And it's like talking about love. You know, uh, my favorite line, I say this all the time, you know, the, the, uh, Larry Norman, a Christian singer, he said, you know, the Beatles said, all you, all, all you need is love, and then they broke up, right? <laughs> love, love is great until you get specific, and then we all start going to the, to the original to, to see whether we, the, the language, to see whether we can translate the verb differently. I can make it more complicated and uncomfortable by talking about current, current events. So remember, take a deep breath, just talking about ideas. We hear a lot about Christian nationalism these days. In the fourth century, 
uh, Emperor Constantine converted to Christianity and declared that the Roman Empire was going to be a Christian empire. And then everything that is done in the name of the empire gets attached to Christianity. Every conquest, every desire of the empire suddenly is done in the name of Jesus. Not a good thing. Los Reyes Católicos, the Catholic monarch monarchs, Ferdinand and Isabel, try to figure out how they're going to unite what is now Spain. Different regions, different languages, different cultures, and they say, oh, let's, u let's use religion. Let's make it, everybody has to be Catholic. And that's how, that's how we're going to unite everybody. So the Moors are expelled, and the Jews are expelled, and the, and the Inquisition, right? Marrying government and religion is never a good thing. And for in, in this day and age, for women, it's terrifying. Because what kind of Christian, Christianity are we talking about? The largest Protestant denomination in this country is the Southern Baptists. And they will kick your church out if you have a woman in leadership. So for women, when you talk about Christian nationalism, we're talking about autonomy. We're, and so too many of our denominations do not, women do not have voice or vote or status. So be very wary and let's stand up for one another. There's a lot that could be said about this, but Christianity is meant to be on the margins critiquing, critiquing the, uh, the values of the, of the modern culture. It's meant to be countercultural. Also with this, Pope Pius was, he said there will never be world peace. There will never be peace if we believe that, you know, ultranationalism, that, that, that my nation is better than your nation and, you know, and me first and everybody else, or that God loves my nation more than, than God loves any other nation. So in faith, we are called to love all people. God, for God so loved the world. And the Great Commission, we are sent out into the world to make disciples. And Abraham and Sarah are promised, through you and your descendants, I'm going to bless the world. So as Christians, we support leaders that when they propose policy that we think Jesus is cool with, we go, yes, I will support that. And when they think, and they propose things that will go against what we believe, our faith, or we go against Jesus' teachings, we're like, Meh. And sometimes it can come from the left, and sometimes it comes from the right, and it's issue to issue. But again, we would need to listen and get curious. And are we listening to God's voice? Because we can be too sure of ourselves about what is the will of God. And life has become uh, very complicated. So, you know, what does the Bible have to say about fracking? What, what verse do we turn to for that? So it's, you know, and I could come up with <laughs> other examples, but you know, we need to be praying what is God's will in this and listening not just for God's voice, but listening to each other because that's sometimes how we discern what the Spirit is saying by listening to one another. We're praying to know what is God's will. It will always be rooted in love. God's will will always be rooted in love. And if we are following God's lead, we will be made to feel discomfort. We will be called to sacrifice. It will ask all of us. We will find ourselves on our knees praying, Lord, more of you and less of me if Christ is king. And then the Revelation passage promises that someday, because what's happening for the, the, in, during that time when it was written, the, the Christians are being persecuted by the state and there's this promise, in the end, in the end, it will all be revealed, and Christ will come, and Christ will reign, hallelujah, and, a, and amen. So this time, I'm gonna, we're going to pray together the prayer that I just said, but let us truly join our hearts in prayer. Most gracious God, who in Jesus of Nazareth showed us an alternative to the kings, queens, and emperors of history, help us to revere and emulate Jesus' leadership to love and to seek justice for all people. Help us to recognize the true grandeur and life-changing power based in loving you and all our neighbors. In Christ Jesus, with you and the Holy Spirit, may we co-create a world ruled not through domination, but in that radical and all-powerful compassion and love. In Jesus' name, may it be so. Amen. You are invited to stand and let's sing together, He is King of Kings.
Join me in the affirmation of faith, which comes from the Theological Declaration of Garmin. Jesus Christ, as he is attested for us in Holy Scripture, is the one word of God which we have to hear and which we have to trust and obey in life and in death. The Christian Church is the congregation of the brethren in which Jesus Christ acts presently as the Lord in word and sacrament through the Holy Spirit. As the church of pardoned sinners, it has to testify in the midst of a sinful world, and its faith and with its obedience, with its message as with the order that is solely his property, and that it lives and wants to live solely from his comfort and from his direction in the expectation of his appearance. Seated. The Lord is the Alpha and the Omega, the one who is, who was, and who is to come the Almighty. All that is, all that was, and all there will be belongs to God. Let us now return to God in part what is God's in whole. Let us continue our worship by the giving of our tithes and our offerings. <laughs>
Let us pray. Holy One, we pray that you take these gifts of our labor, our wealth, our time, and our lives and use them to express your everlasting kingdom of love in this world. Amen. Please be seated. And again, let us join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, we pray that in our hearts, and we are always pulled in different directions, we pray that in our hearts and our minds and our wills and in our bodies and all our members that you might reign. And reign us in, Lord. Call us home. Keep us humble. And keep us listening for your voice. And keep us listening to one another so that we might discern together what is your will and what is your work for us in this world. Lord, we thank you for all the people who, um, who make a difference, for the love and the care that they have shown to each of us as individuals, as a community. We are grateful for all the ways that we, love has been modeled for us. Lord, we pray for the parts of the world that are aching and breaking apart. We pray for the wind of your love to cover your people. We think of the folks on the West Coast affected by the bomb cyclone, the United, United States and parts of Canada. Lord, we, the people of Ukraine, as they mark a thousand days of war, Lord, we pray for peace. We pray for the humanitarian crisis in Gaza. Lord, we pray for peace. We pray for the people of uh, India, where a you know, thick, visible blanket of smog has covered uh, Delhi, shut down schools, prevented outdoor work, with an increasing number of people going to the hospital because of respiratory problems for pollution. God, we know that there are many who are helping, praying, caring, and changing the lives of those affected by all these crises, challenges, and changes in your people's lives. We give you thanks for first responders, for aid workers, community leaders offering hope and assistance. We're grateful that we can support them through our giving. Lord, may we be inspired to make a difference to challenge the status quo and to embody your expansive and indescribable love. While what we do may seem small, remind us that we are here to offer your love to others just as all the people who have done that for us. Grant us comfort, relief, justice as we try our best to be your hands and feet, feet in this world as we try to embody your love. Lord, we lift up Eli and Chris, Bob and Ingrid, Daniel, John, Natalie, Indra, Michael, Bonnie and Barry, Graciela, Andrea, Cliff and Diane, Chrissy, Marion, Erica, Manfred and Vicky, Janet and Jillian. You know what's going on with them, Lord. We pray that your spirit might move in them and through them, bring them healing and wholeness or peace. May they have eyes to see and ears to hear that you are with them in real and tangible ways. We pray and with thanksgiving that Irene is with us this morning and can pray for her continued recovery. We pray for Damien, for Paul, for Norman. We pray for all our caregivers. We pray for all our elected officials. We pray for um, how you are calling us to show up in our local communities and how we show up as a church. May our faith remain strong and we are grateful uh, that in the promises of 2025, a new pastor back into a, a new building, Lord in your mercy, what a, uh, exciting things ahead. And Lord, we pray for the pastoral nominating committee and their discernment. May you bless all of them with just that, that yes, that sense that goes across, across the board and in every heart and mind, yes. 
Lord, we pray all of this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You are invited to stand in body or in spirit as we sing Crown Him with Many Crowns, number 151. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to be seated just because I have a few announcements. So today's food offering uh, benefited the uh, Montclair Neighborhood Development. Uh, Happy Thanksgiving uh, early. The office will be, grow will be closed Thursday and Friday. Uh, and if you come to choir rehearsal on Thursday night, you will uh, find a locked door. Uh, they're not they, you will be alone. Um, Next week, I am going to be in Seattle uh, with my daughter. We were supposed to take a family trip to Spain, and my, um, my son tore his um, ACL and his meniscus, and so he's having to have an operation. So walking around uh, being a tourist didn't, was not recommended. So in solace, my daughter and I are going to Seattle for a mom and me trip um, following the bomb cyclone, so right? So it'll be interesting. Um, but my friend, Chad Rogers, who I hope you love him as much as I do, will be here next week leading worship. I absolutely adore Chad, and, uh, and I hope you do too. On the 8th, the, our, the church is hosting uh, the community dinner. Um, there are flyers if you want to take one and post it someplace. On the 6th, the Season with Grace is having a Christmas luncheon at Lauren Meyer's house. Men's Fellowship Breakfast is December 3rd, 8 a.m. 
Cookie Exchange, Crafting and Cookie Exchange at the Mance, one to three on December 7th. That is fun. Um, I think, oh, one more thing. I was told by Union Kong that they're having a coat drive and that there would be a basket by the door. There is no basket by a door. There's a basket by their door. But, um, so I brought a, you know, we have tons of coats in my, in my house, so I'm using this opportunity to go through. I'm encouraging you to go through, and I'll bring a bin for our door, and so in the coming weeks, let's go through your closets, and uh, let's provide some warmth for people who need it, and that's all I got. Let's stand. Let us leave this place with the confidence that we want Christ to be number one in our lives, with the humility that knows that we will fall short, but also the, the joy that knows that we are forgiven and we are freed to try again and again, trying to get it right until the day we die, until the day that Jesus comes to reign forever and ever. Let us go knowing that the God who knit us together in our mother's wombs would die for us and did. He rose again in power and strength through the power of the Holy Spirit, God walks with us this day and every day. May our song always be hallelujah. Let us go in peace. Amen.